me test my headphones. Hello, this is the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. <laughs> Coming at you live, all day, all night. Pay attention, motherfuckers. <laughs> Something cool might happen, and you'll miss it. Keep going. Well, in some cases, you want, you want to have more bass. You want to have more sounding, good sounding, uh, really audio in there. But if it's not going to be that easy because you have to set it up right so you make sure that it's not a tumor. So many answers we may never know. Too many questions get on with the show. No time for the chorus, only this verse. It's good to you. Open the podcast doors, Hal. It's Kubrick's Universe, the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Okay, that's 7450. 7450, all right. There's 80. I promised you 50 bucks over the meter, right? I'll make that 100. If you wait for me. So let the meter run. I'll give you the other half plus the meter when I get back. Okay? How long are you going to be? I don't know, maybe an hour or more, but maybe only 10 minutes. I'll leave my stuff here in the back. Okay? Okay. Hello, good evening, and welcome back, my friends, to the podcast that never ends. We're so glad you could attend because here we are once again with the world's only continuously running podcast dedicated to the craft, the life, and the brilliance of the late, great Stanley Kubrick. We are Kubrick's universe, and we couldn't be happier to have the opportunity to help bring his legacy into this brave new digital age. At the boards is the hardest working man in the podcast business, our producer, chief researcher, editor, and all-around bon vivant, Stephen Rigg. I am your host, resident music maker, co-writer, and humble narrator, Jason Furlong. Okay, so this year, 2019, marks the 20th anniversary of the release of Stanley Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut. It's a film about many things, and like all his other major works, it has been examined, picked apart, and analyzed under many thousands of different microscopes. And while it may or may not be about any number of things that as many theories might have us believe, Eyes Wide Shut is certainly about the many trappings and pitfalls presented by some very real perspectives on the nature of sex, marriage, jealousy, and the power of dreams. To this day, among casual fans and film scholars alike, Kubrick's final film remains deep, disturbing, and divisive. It may have taken Stanley Kubrick as many as 50 years of his life to gestate his initial experience with Schnitzler's novella, Tram Novel, into what became his final film at the age of only 70. According to those who knew him well, what started as a German language novella from the 1920s was a backburner passion project throughout Kubrick's years, and it ultimately became the last full-length feature that Stanley would leave us with. Today, we are very happy to have on the show the co-authors of a fantastic new book called Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick and the Making of His Final Film. Drawing upon deep dives of research from the Stanley Kubrick archives at the University of Arts in London, as well as their own unique perspectives from both sides of the Atlantic, the authors set out to create a veritable archaeology of this truly one-of-a-kind film, from its earliest origins to its protean creation at the hands of the master and then beyond even the grasp of the late auteur who considered Eyes Wide Shut his finest film. Robert P. Colker is Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland, and he's taught cinema studies for almost 50 years. He is the author of A Cinema of Loneliness, The Altering Eye, Film, Form, and Culture, and The Extraordinary Image, Wells, Hitchcock, Kubrick, and The Reimagination of Cinema. His current project is Triumph Over Containment, 
American film in the 1950s. And Nathan Abrams is professor in film at Bangor University in Wales. He is the founding co-editor of Jewish Film and New Media, an international journal, as well as the author of The New Jew in Film, Exploring Jewishness and Judaism in Contemporary Cinema, and, of course, Stanley Kubrick, New York Jewish Intellectual, which is a book we already love. Drawing upon hours of new interviews they conducted with key cast and crew members, as well as tasking themselves with a great deal of heady new research and examination, the authors have managed to create not just a timeline of the project, but also an unequaled appreciation of the film and the man who had clearly felt a sense of personal pride in making sure he brought the story of Eyes Wide Shut to the big screen. So it's with great pleasure we welcome Robert Kolker and Nathan Abrams to the show. So how you doing, guys? Welcome. Doing great. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be back. Always a pleasure. Great to hear your voice. Um, so... I want to begin by asking, uh, you've both written books on film prior to this one, and we're curious how you arrived at uh, choosing to write one specifically about Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, Robert, if you want to answer first, that's cool. Sure. Well, I wrote a long chapter on Kubrick and Cinema of Loneliness way back when, and wrote about Kubrick more recently in a book on... uh, uh, Hitchcock, Wells, and and Kubrick, and it was a good uh, a good idea to sort of narrow the focus onto one film. And since it took me a long time to make peace with Eyes Wide Shut, and I'm not sure that I've done it yet, hmm. it uh, it seemed like um, a good idea not only to write about the film but to write about Kubrick and uh, the creative process. That's interesting. Um, and Nathan, uh, I take it you guys were friends already. How did you come to this project? Um, yeah, that's right. Um, I'm trying to remember when Bob and I first uh, made contact, um, but we'd been talking to each other's classes over Skype for a few years. And um, to be honest, um, this, this was Bob's um, baby, and um, he approached me. Um, to collaborate with him, for which I'm still grateful. And, um, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity to to write a book on one film. I mean, one doesn't often get that opportunity to just, you know, look at one film and go into the detail of its history and, and everything. And, of course, you know, uh, if any filmmakers, uh, films individually could be... Uh, subject matter for an entire book, it would be Kubrick's, and Eyes Wide Shut is certainly an interesting choice. Um, I'm wondering how you two ended up splitting your duties on the book. You know, the, I, don't, I don't know if splitting is the right word. It was a collaboration from beginning to end. Hmm. Um, in fact, in, when I reread or look at it again, it's really hard for me to tell who wrote what. <laughs> Um, it, edit that His out. dog disagrees. Luna disagrees. It's hard for <laughs> for Luna to tell either. Apparently, uh, Luna's like, we know yours, Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Shut the That's door. That's great. No, it's cool. It's cool. I love um, it. Nathan is certainly um, a better researcher than I am, and was able to find details. Um, in the uh, in the archives that I would have missed. So, as far as that part of the collaboration goes, um, Nathan was really um, strong in 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 finding the most minute and and in fact not resting until he found the most minute and important details, and that really made the book. Um, as uh, as good as it is hmm. can i can i um nathan yeah please i want your take <laughs> yeah i mean i mean thanks thanks to bob i mean i think it works really well we both have kind of complementary but um and it's uh, sort of overlapping strengths in a way that like a venn diagram hmm. um in the middle of kubrick i mean bob has a phenomenal knowledge of film history 
and can spot references and and um you know uh, that that i suppose more than i would be able to and and can place the and uh, as we did the film in a context of a history of film i mean i also benefited from the fact that i just lived closer to the archives so could could take more trips down there what it also meant was dividing this between us i mean you know two bodies of knowledge two sort of slightly different ways of working um meant that you know i didn't have to neither of us had to recreate ourselves into something we weren't at that point and at the same time it meant that um you know um we could get a lot more drafting done um you know one of us could be drafting whilst the other one was doing something else so it was a very kind of efficient process um and then there was a lot of back and forth so it was a, it was a, it was a very good way to work and, and and in the chronology section um it lists several points in time where uh kubrick was involved with discussing planning producing uh the film that ultimately became eyes wide shut and we know that his interest in the story possibly dates back to the 1940s when he was a teenager and he may have had Kirk Douglas as an early champion of uh, Schnitzler's uh, novella. Kubrick had discussions with at least a dozen writers, if I'm not mistaken, including uh, Anthony Burgess and Diane Johnson, Michael Hare, uh, Terry Southern, John Le Carre. And we know his casting ideas included, you know, such uh, seemingly not typecastable choices as uh, Woody Allen in the early 70s and later Steve Martin, which he's spoken about. What were you guys able to unearth about how the final film of Eyes Wide Shut was developed by Kubrick over those many decades? I'll ask you first, Robert. It was in the background, and what we understood was that it provided a kind of ongoing undercurrent of desire on Kubrick's part. It wasn't an obsession by any means. Um, It was there. It was something that he wanted to make. Um, At one point, he was in in the 1950s, as, as, um, as Nathan has discovered, there were a number of works by uh, Austrian and German writers that uh, he was interested in. But for a variety of reasons, a lot of them commercial reasons, uh, a lot of them personal reasons, he made the films that he made. And, And it wasn't until he, it wasn't until he, um, sorry. It's entirely appropriate that we have a, we have dogs interrupting us. Uh, wound up and um, it was there. There are two dogs at play here. Is that your dog, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to this is like Kubrick working. My head is. <laughs> I hope you got a cat lying on the editing desk there, Steve. That's brilliant. Oh my gosh. All right, girls. Come is on. it? Is there a dog at Bob's house as well? Yeah, yeah, that's Bob's dog who started it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my dog started it. It's uh, my dog. Listen, so fe- a transatlantic conversation. Yeah, fellas, we're just going to fade into the background and let them do the Skype. Right, let them. <laughs> I'm not sure they're Kubrick fans. <laughs> oh, they will be by the end of this episode. <laughs> hey, come on, settle down. <laughs> This is Moose's first podcast. Pepper's done these before. <laughs> of Come course. on, settle down. <laughs> Come on. So, oh my gosh. Um, it was a background, it was sort of background, undercurrent, not exactly noise, but something that was there for Kubrick. He always had it, if not on his mind, then readily ready to think about. And it wasn't until the 1990s when the the films that he wanted to make, um, Aryan Papers and um, Artificial Intelligence, fell through for a variety of reasons that he finally felt ready to 
do eyes wide shut or to do to take Traum Nobel and turn it into a film. And that began an enormous process of uh, finding screenwriters and uh, finding a script and developing and getting the actors and finally putting it together. By which time he was an old man who didn't have to prove anything. And so he took his time. Um, the people he worked with were willing to give him the time. And so the film came about as it did. Um, I don't think it would be, Nathan, feel free to disagree with me. I don't think it's a culmination film. I think it's a film that he was ready to make at the point in which he finally made it. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, it's, I suppose we can treat it as one because it was his final film, but I suppose, you know, I don't know, was he aware of his own health failings? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a question to be asked because it does seem re so heavily autobiographical in a way that probably the most, or, you know, since Barry Lyndon and the shining that I think, you know, I, I agree with Bob, but at the same time, there's that interesting sense of he poured a lot of himself into it and not that he didn't pour himself into his other films, but I think it's expressed on screen in a different way because he was going home. Yeah, you know, and 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 you know the first film made or well it wasn't made but set in New York since since uh, and it's Kiss right so yep. uh, you know four 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 and a half decades earlier, um, it it's certainly you know whether he knew it or not it's sort of there's a lot of omens in there. Yeah, well, so you mentioned the decades and. Uh... My last question uh, to you both, you know, uh, involved what you were able to find out about uh, his interest. And I'm just wondering, uh, since you're such a great researcher, Nathan, was there anything particularly new or revelatory about his uh, developing of the film throughout those decades that you learned in your research? Well, yeah, I mean, I had it confirmed through multiple sources that I mean, Leon Vitali told me um, that um, pretty much when Stanley was starting out as a um, feature filmmaker, so um, so we'll be talking in the early 50s now, he wanted to adapt Traum Novella. And, um, you know, that that was kind of confirmation, really, that his interest didn't start just after 2001, just the the generally accepted idea but but you know sort of almost 20 years earlier or at least 15 years earlier so um and that that came through multiple sources and you know when you see what else he's trying to adapt around that time you know schnitzler zweig um he's definitely keenly interested in the literature from 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 vienna in the late 19th early 20th century and as new material in the archive shows, he was working on films about marriage, adultery, fidelity, jealousy, betrayal um, in that period. So this is something that's guided him all along. I think eventually when we uncover all this material in more detail, it will it'll change our view of Kubrick. It's not necessarily being a director all about war or, right. or allegedly yeah. cold, you know? Maybe those are the films he just ended up making, but not the films that necessarily he really wanted to make. I'm, I'm throwing that out there. No, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because in my own personal life, I've been, you know, rejecting in conversations here and there with just film fans or people who, you know, uh, are drawn to Kubrick, uh, who will comment that they like him, but they feel that there's, you know, he's cold. And, and since you brought that up, I... I've always found some way, hopefully articulately, to kind of make them rethink that position because I, I don't see that um, on the contrary, but I think it requires a deeper examination, not just of his movies, but the man who made them. 
and and why he chose to make those projects. It's funny because yeah, I mean, three films about war or two anti-war uh, or three anti-war s- sentiments properly, I should say. But I've never thought of him as a, a filmmaker who, you know, focused on war, even though three of his 13 features, I guess, fall into that category. I just always found him to be more interested overall in the human condition. And if, fortunately, unfortunately, that's played out a lot throughout our history in war. Um, but I want to ask um, uh, Nathan first, uh, what do we know about Arthur Schnitzler, who wrote the uh, novella? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this is one for Bob too. Um, you know, he was a physician and, um, he, uh, but, but made mainly his success by writing, uh, plays and, and short stories and, and novellas in which he explored through fiction, what Freud was doing in his work. And Freud wrote a letter to Schnitzler, which we quote in the book saying, that he avoided him out of fear of uh, meeting his doppelganger. And so he's very much interested in the same things, you know, kept a diary of his dreams, every dream uh, he had, um, apparently allegedly kept a diary of every orgasm he had. Um, he was somewhat of a philanderer. Um, it's interesting because if we read um, um, Schnitzler as being the kind of Bill character, uh, well, at least Fridolin, in, in, in Tran novella, I don't think Bill could be farther from the character that Schnitzler was in real life. You know, he was a Jew. He, he liked a duel, or at least was willing to have a duel, um, had an eye for the ladies, definitely, um, but was also a kind of middle class Jewish um, uh, boy who was encouraged by his father and his different in his interests, which resonates with um, Kubrick's background. I, I, I mean, we suspect that Kubrick. Saw some affinity there, Uh, not just in the writing, which he expressed admiration for from the 50s onwards, but I think also in the person himself. And he definitely is an interesting individual. That's that's nicely put. I I like the the connection there that, you know, it makes sense. So, um, Robert, were you able to uh, find out uh, research about... uh, Schnitzler, the man before uh, you guys came to this project? I was not familiar with Schnitzler. Um, he was very famous in his time, part of, a, of an important movement in late 19th, early 20th century uh, uh, Viennese art, um, the uh, period that produced Gustav Klimt, the painter. Um, his work provides a lot of the ideas for the set decoration and lighting in Eyes Wide Shut. Um, But he had sort of fallen, not out of favor, but just sort of out of mind. Um, There were more prominent um, uh, German and um, German language writers that sort of eclipsed him, Thomas Mann and and Kafka, obviously. Uh, I think Eyes Wide Shut sort of revived interest in uh, in Schnitzler, um, at least certainly brought his name to more people's attention. Yeah, um, it was interesting. I had a chat with Jan and his wife um, over Friday night dinner, actually, at my mum's house, my parents' house. And um, I remember him saying uh, after the war, you know, when they were looking for German literature, obviously because of what had preceded it, um, there were a lot of tainted writers and they needed to find people who were kind of clean in the post-war era, you know, in Germany and Austria. And uh, Schnitzler being banned as Jewish filth um, w- was okay. It, he was, and so there was interest in, 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 in continental Europe in him. But like Bob says, um, somewhat obscure, I suppose, outside of German studies um, in, in, in the academy. And, uh, um, you know, it's interesting because I wonder even if, the film has awakened any great interest in him being <laughs> outside of, it's a outside fair of question. Kind of, and Kubrick fans. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. I don't know that um, no. his reputation has revived any. It's just that his name is suddenly now uh, known to more people than it was before. Yeah, and no, no one really cashed in on um, 
tie-in editions or, or um, you know, Pushkin Press reissued Stefan Zweig in these nice, handsome edition um, recently, and they did it with his um, autobiography, but 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 they haven't done it with Schnitzler, so it's interesting. He still remains somewhat in the shadows, I would say. Hmm. Well, you know, there was a first uh, interpretation, which Schnitzler, of course, uh, ad- adapted into a screenplay himself back in the 1930s. So I wonder, uh, Robert, uh, do you know if uh, Kubrick ever saw that version? I don't think there was any indication that he saw the uh, the screenplay that Schnitzler sort of tinkered with. Hmm. The, the only thing that uh, we came across was a reference in a German language website uh, uh, that claimed that, that Kubrick had seen it. Um, but that website is now defunct. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the one source that, that claims that Kubrick was familiar with it and also with the Austrian TV version, which was, what, 69? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, well, it's disappeared and he's the only person who said this. So everyone else denies it. So on the balance of evidence that's available, I mean, I, you know, what's the expression the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence mm, so mm. depends which way you want to go with that one now there's a rumor that uh once kubrick bought the rights to the book uh he had gone on a bit of a worldwide search to uh buy up as many copies or even every copy that he could is that just a rumor um, he tended to do that when he could with properties that uh, he was ready to film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Tony, Tony with that many copies to find to to buy up. <laughs> yeah, no, that last bit is that Tony Fruin, you know Kubrick's um, assistant for years, said he bought up every copy in as much as a few limited uh, those that a book dealer, a few limited book dealers were able to get hold of wow i mean it does seem like it would be stanley's won't to do something just like that but uh i've never heard it confirmed before so that's really interesting well i want to uh jump ahead a little bit now and discuss the production of eyes wide shut and uh firstly there's an account of uh, the actor todd field uh who spoke about being on the whole uh, you know being on the whole shoot uh, and that it was done almost entirely at night for 18 months straight. And um, I'll ask Nathan first, do you know if this was something to do uh, on Stanley's part with trying to create an atmosphere, again, this dream world? Well, that's part of it, but it's like what Bob said uh, earlier on. I mean, he wasn't in a rush. He wanted to get this right. Hmm. He wasn't under pressure. You know, he didn't have to deliver by a certain date. He just had to deliver what he was happy with Mm. and you know how many directors get that freedom so um you know if something wasn't going right if it didn't look right if it on on camera i mean for him it doesn't matter what your planning is it had to look right on camera Mm. i mean the classic stories with the g-strings in the orgy that he'd um, done the meticulous research had them had the models wear the g-strings and once he started to shoot he said these these look all wrong Mm. Uh, he turned to Mary Tyler and he said, these are wrong. She said, yeah, well, you, you picked them. He goes, yeah, that's neither here nor there. They're wrong. They're wrong. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what your planning is in that sense. If the road doesn't look right on the monitor mm-hmm. or the mask or, or the lighting or the um, um, or the way the incense, you know, they took ages to get the incense right on the orgy sequence. Mm-hmm. Then, then, you know, he, he, he shot it again and he shot it again and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, I think it was that sense of I'm not going to be rushed here. And then again, we know he did whole retakes of scenes with different actors because he wasn't happy mm. with the originals. So that, that just elongated matters. Mm. Um, the oh, dreamlike sure. sequence I think came in the production design and then in the, in, in the, in the push processing afterwards. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I, I can't contradict somebody who was there, but it, from what we understood, it was almost 24 hour a a day um, 
job. Mm -hmm. And the nights were for setups for the following day's shoot. So he would have his small crew uh, set up the lighting and and, um, and the camera positions for the next day. Um, so I'm not sure that they shot only at night. Um, I don't know if um, British unions would have allowed that. Mm. Well, um, Stephen, our uh, producer, uh, points out that there were other reports in his research um, that pointed to uh, different call times on the call sheets that might contradict uh, what the actor Todd Field uh, described. Quite likely that, that maybe the scenes that he shot were only at night. Yeah. Thinking about it, when do we see him? We see him in the Sonata. Um, and we see, I mean, that could have been shot any time of day. So neither here nor there, I suppose, because it's indoors. He's all in indoor sequences. Um, and they did shoot the orgy sequences at night. Um, or at least they start in the late evening, early afternoon, you know. But by the time they actually did all the setups, they probably did actually do the shooting at night. So anything he's in probably was shot at night. Doesn't mean all of it was. Mm. Yeah. I can't help but wonder if uh, some aspect of that was his preference, given that, as we've heard, he famously stayed on New York time for the rest of his life, even after he moved to the UK. So that might have made him something of a high-functioning night owl, if you will. That sounds like another Kubrick fanciful tale is that so because i forget where i heard that but i know it was from more than one source i think it, hmm. it yeah a night owl i mean we've heard that he's a night owl right hmm. i've never heard it connected it to him being on new york time there <laughs> the he dog able, the dog thought it was funny function um, <laughs> professionally if would if he did that well if i'm not mistaken christiana pointed out it was a really interesting, it was poignant but bittersweet that even though he passed at only 70, which, you know, it did feel really young to me at the time, I'm sure a lot of people, that uh, it was, I'm sure you can tell me if I'm not getting this accurately, but she said that if you if you take into account the fact that he would sleep so little, that in the final analysis you do the math and he actually lived more than so many other people. He was awake for so many more hours of the day. Mm. that, And I, I thought that was, again, just poignant, yeah. but sad in a way. He took care of his mind at the expense of his body. Bingo. Well said. Thank you, Robert. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I want to uh, jump ahead because on, uh, I believe it was page 90, uh, you both mentioned that Kubrick would not let Tom Cruise on set during the scene when Nicole uh, and the sailor are making love, uh, nor did he let uh, Nicole on the set when Tom was at the orgy. And it's stated in your book that this was to create an actual real-life uh, form of jealousy, a psychological mistrust, if you will, between um, the real-life couple they were at the time. Uh, I would love for you both to expand on that. Robert, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I think, I think we, one can go too far in talking about how Kubrick put his actors under stress. At the same time, he was very anxious to get a kind of response that expressed the anxiety that both of the, or each of the, of the, of the couples rather, were experiencing, uh, or the, each of the couple's characters were experiencing. And it makes sense to have um, crews not present with the scenes with the sailor. Um, first of all, it would have probably have made Nicole Kidman uncomfortable and that may have been more of a reason than creating jealousy in, uh, for Tom. And not having Nicole present at the orgy, it may not, it may be nothing more mysterious than she wasn't needed. 
And, you know, we sometimes tend to forget that films are shot out of sequence and that characters or actors are not present all the time. Um, and if they're photographed from the back, their stand-ins are used and they, so they don't have to be around. Um, so I think there's a little bit of everything going on that, to be sure, he wanted to create a certain amount of stress in the, uh, in the uh, characters and in the actors who played them. But I think there's also the reality of, uh, of the production. Nathan, would you uh, expand on that? Yeah. Or, I mean, corroborate what Robert said as well? Uh, yeah, that's a corroborate. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, why, why have Nicole standing around freezing at night in an orgy sequence in which she doesn't feature, you know? Um, similarly, they didn't even have necessarily have Tom Cruise all the time in those sequences. Um, they use body doubles when they didn't have to show its face. So um, that's just practical. Um, you know, I mean, with this, with the sailor sequences between Nicole and the sailor, um, you know, the idea was is that he did it deliberately. Uh, he deliberately kept them apart. But what we found out was that he just took advantage of the fact that Bill had to go back home. Uh, Bill, sorry, Tom had to go back home uh, to the U.S. and uh, that was just as good a time to shoot it because. You didn't need Bill for those, uh, Bob, uh, Bill, Tom for those scenes. So, um, you know, it's all part of the interesting, you know, Eyes Wide Shut's the only film that Kubrick made in the internet era. And um, so the, 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 the sheer number of stories could, could, yeah. just, could, could, could proliferate more than British tabloids like to do anyway. <laughs> and um, don't forget he made it in Britain where we have a very – vibrant for want of a better word tabloid culture so feeding these internet stories so there's there's still a lot of mythology uh, around the film that is yet to be punctured um and and some of the stuff surrounding tom and nicole is, is definitely a heavy a key part of that sure um well in puncturing that mythology you know we came across something very interesting uh, many, of course, in your book. But one thing that's uh, uh, worth asking is, in regards to the opening titles where we see a quick shot of Nicole Kidman undressing, and in your book it states that this shot was actually added after Kubrick's death, and it came from a series of revealing shots um, of Nicole in various states of undress that were ultimately unused. Can you both tell us about this and who decided on adding that? Um, sure. Um, you know, bear in mind, um, anything that was done post-production was done in line with Stanley's wishes. Um, and, you know, one of the difficulties you have researching Stanley Kubrick in the later days, in the latter days, are that, you know, a lot of his conversations are conducted by telephone, fax, and um, by means that which they haven't been necessarily res um, preserved for posterity. So clearly there were conversations probably going on of which we're, we're never going to really know and uh, where he would have communicated his ideas um, to however, you know, maybe not to everybody, but to key individuals like Leon Vitali. Um, so the, the post-production team, which was Leon Vitali and Jan Harlan and the editors, um, Nigel Galt and um, Vi uh, Mel Melanie Viner Caneo, right? Um, if that's how you say her name. I've only seen it written down. Um, they're, they're the key team working on the post-production in accordance uh, with the posthumous post-production in accordance with Stanley's wishes. And we did find a document. I mean, for us, this was the closest we got to kind of the, the, the um, you know, the Sapruda footage or whatever this Kubrick equivalent is, um, to say that this is what needed doing in post-production and this is who's going to do it. And that document referred to this insert um, of a shot that Kubrick... So they didn't take the shot after Kubrick died. You know, this 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 shot was had already been compiled. Right, right, of course. So who knows? He might have said, "This is going to go there." 
just just you know make sure it's done but we we don't ever see that writ- written down um so there's two ways of looking at it there's well this film isn't as kubrick would have done it because it was done after he died by people who weren't kubrick that's one argument the other side of it is yes but they could clearly probably did this in accordance with what they they understood he wanted yes right but yeah no we can't find the document you know because there wouldn't be one he wouldn't he wouldn't need to write it down to leon you know right right if you're seeing a guy every day for 23 hours out of a day or however many hours leon did you don't need to just write on a piece of yeah. paper unless it's a <laughs> you know but the purists would then say but we need that piece and right that, you know need that you know that's not realistic. You know, if it was something like "Remember to lock the door and feed the cat," then we do <laughs> see that. <laughs> Three melons, exactly. No fewer. <laughs> um, you know, I want to uh, ask about uh, Lisa Leone. Um, she did some of the on location second unit shots in New York, and um, she describes in your book how Kubrick had been discussing her reshooting the exterior establishing shot at uh, Ziegler's New York mansion just prior to his uh, passing. And I'm just going to hazard a guess. This does fairly prove that he was still tinkering with the film right up to his own death, does it not? Yeah, he always did on all of his films. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Most, In fact, it's not unique. Most filmmakers do edit until... It's time for uh, uh, release or preview. Um, so Kubrick did tinker. And given the fact that, that he had to really closely synchronize the on location second unit material with the uh, staged material, um, he would have been very interested, obviously, in getting it just right and synchronizing it just right. Mm. Nathan? Yeah, I mean, the nice quote I heard, I think we, we put it in the book, is for Kubrick, a film was a living a living thing. Mm. I mean, you know, he lent his hand to the restoration of Spartacus in 91, or at least some kind of hand. So, it, you know, that's that's 31 years after the fact. You know, he, he didn't... One of the reasons he made so few films is Kubrick spent so much time doing so much on both the films he was making and the films he had made. You know, the color grading, all mm-hmm, this, making mm-hmm. sure that transfers to different formats were right, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in that sense, of course, what we see isn't a final thing. You know, probably, you know, with all of his films, we haven't, you know, the recent 4K transfers, um, presumably some work was done by someone who knew his wishes to make that transfer mm-hmm. in accordance with his wishes. So, Although he was not around to do it, you know, that film's still a living thing. The the painting was completed, as it were, for better or worse, after his uh, untimely passing in the summer of 1999. We did get the uh, release of the film, uh, which was inevitable. And, of course, it proved divisive with critics, uh, audiences alike. It was pretty quickly uh, a divisive film, as were many of his other releases at the time of their release. And it, it seems in hindsight there was some expectation uh, of the film that it wasn't uh, quite delivered uh, in the way that some people, particularly Kubrick diehards, were hoping for. Um, and in a, in a way also relating to the public's uh, taste for uh, certain things such as how much of Tom and Nicole's bodies they were hoping would be revealed. And while that may be lowbrow examination for us, it it, it did occur at the time. And and there was an expectation. I remember it where, you know, people were saying this this new Kubrick film, when it comes out, it's going to be almost like a porno, that there would be some rather explicit sex scenes. And of course, you know, that immediately uh, was shown to not be the case. So I want to ask Robert first, do you know how that misinformation transpired around the time? It was largely uh, Warner Brothers' fault because they uh, promoted it as a, as a sex film uh, or promoted its erotic uh, elements. And 
there's another thing going on too. And I think it was part of my initial response to the film. Kubrick's films up to Eyes Wide Shut are very big in many senses of the word. Their images are big. Um, the actions are big. The acting is big. Eyes Wide Shut, everything is small. It's in many ways the smallest film that he's made. Um, it's, my, it's, it's detail is minute. And it is in some ways the least Kubrickian film because it is so quiet, subtle, um, n not explosive. The big moments, like the orgy, for example, um, are themselves muted. Mm. Um, we don't have the explosions like we have in uh, Full Metal Jacket uh, or the, the light show in 2001 or Jack Nicholson's over-the-top performance in The, in the Shining. Uh, everything is quiet. It's almost uh, as if you're suggesting it's his uh, his most art house film, if you will. Exactly. It was, and and this has been pointed out by others that it was an art house film after the period of the art house film was over. Nathan, what uh, what was your take on that? Uh, you know, we're about the same age. What was your reaction to the way the public reacted to it at the time? You know, I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember the uh, the reaction. I'm I'm still not that interested in. Um, I mean, one looks at critical reception because that you have to as an academic, but I'm you know still not that that interested. That there's two points I wanted to make, and one's kind of also part of an answer to the previous question. Um, the first point is in, in one of the so sequences we see um, Bill, I think, is at a costume store, and over his shoulder is an, a triple X sign you know, for, for an adult video store. Um, and uh, uh, I thought that was a, you know, not only would you probably see one in New York, but at the same time, it was a little sly nod to Kubrick sticking in the kind of thing that audiences were expecting or hoping the film to be, mm. but didn't turn out to be. Um, and the, the the other point I wanted to make was, it just goes back to your previous question about, you know, how finished was the film. One thing I would like to say is, yeah, there were things done in post-production, but I think they were minor edits. Overall, the narrative and the, the narrative thrust and the quietness and the subtlety and everything that Bob just said was, was in place. And people have um, spun huge theories over the fact that he edited The Shining and, and uh, 2001 and, and, you know, whilst it was being released or shown to audiences and ergo he would have done the same with eyes wide shut because they were disappointed by what they saw but um i think that, that it literally would have been tinkering at the edges a a, a, sh a track here instead of the uh, playback track on set an edit here a shot there a clean up here a clean up there um some some dialogue editing here um you know but by and large that the, the film was was done right. and you know those little even if it was 95 percent done the five percent you know were tinkers they weren't they weren't re radically changing the whole but i think and that then speaks to that critical reaction that seems to think that had he lived those five percent would have actually been the whole that would have been tinkered with and I think, you know, and, and, and like Bob has said, people just didn't get it or didn't want to get it. Didn't want to get it, right. I think that's, yeah, the latter examination is a well put. And there's something else that, uh, well, I don't get, and I want to tread very lightly about this, but you did bring it up in the book, and it pertains to the conspiracy theories that uh, began surrounding the film uh, early after its... Uh, release and only more so in the internet age, in the age of social media. Um, I'd like to ask you both about 
uh, why you wanted to address that and uh, what your own personal takes are on it. If, Nathan, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in primarily in not, not what any of these conspiracy theories have to say. I think they're all, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah agreed, right. You fill in the blank. <laughs> mm-hmm. What too much, too much time on their hands. Uh, yeah, and and what I'm interested in is, I can't think of another filmmaker who attracts this kind of conspiratorializing thinking. <clears throat> um, you know, maybe I'm wrong and I'm or ignorant, but you know, gr- the great filmmakers of the 20th century, I can't, don't seem to have attracted this kind of level of YouTube. Um, fascination no no one else Um, so that's point number one so therefore we have to think why 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 is this the case with kubrick and is it i think there's two further answers then to that which is one the nature of his films in itself the fact that it was so meticulous coupled with so layered so layered so rich in which he didn't he refused to tell us what to think but gave us the tools with which to think so that then gives us a lot of room for interpretation. And two, I can't help but think he, he fits the perfect profile of an individual who attracts conspiratorializing Jewish, right? Um, and intellectual, alleged, well, hermetic, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, reclusive, um, working with a, only a small coterie of trusted advisors who was known to love codes and therefore stuck codes in, in his films. Um, there's a character I compare Kubrick to called Leo Strauss, who was considered the eminence grees behind um, the war in Iraq in Bush's, George W. Bush's second term. And um, he's a long dead obscure philosopher, but people resurrected him because he fit that same profile. Mm. Obscure, cultish, cultic, um, um, hermetic, you know, reclusive, a loyal band of followers with which he inserted secret codes, and mm-hmm. guess what, Jewish, right? Um, and people do seem to, to seem to uh, paste misanthropic on him as well. Again, falsely, I would say, but that was something I remember reading in print journalism about him back in the day because you know he lived in his compound and he never left except to make movies, etc. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that kind of Howard Hughes type thing. Right, right. Um, you know, and all the other the things. But to me, what's intriguing is none of the conspiracy theories in of, in of themselves. My single biggest complaint with most of them is they only ever tell you about one film. And if we're treating Kubrick as an auteur, which we do, then it, it, the theory doesn't stand up if it only applies to one film. That's a really good point. Yeah. Kubrick's films, contrary to what I said a few minutes ago, are overwhelming. Um, Even Eyes Wide Shut as a miniature is overwhelming. There's so much there. And I think for some people that rather than accepting being overwhelmed and then going deeper into what the elements are that overwhelm them, They get sidetracked and say, well, if this was my experience, then there's something going on that I can't account for, and I have to account for it. And so they begin to build and feed each other with these uh, with these theories of uh, what the films are actually saying, when in fact, what the films are actually saying are what they're actually saying. (laughs) Um, Yes. Which doesn't, yeah, I mean, it doesn't negate interpretation, but interpretation and conspiracy uh, theories are very different. Nathan, yeah, you I mean, to build on that, if you didn't like the film, right, uh, or you thought that there was some missing footage, then you'd come up with a theory as to why that is, right? Sure. You know, there's a missing 23, or was it 24 minutes? Because. Right. <laughs> Right. You know, because you weren't happy with the hour. If you're happy with the film, I mean, that's one aspect of it. I suppose some of those people were happy with The Shining, but still come out with these theories. So, um, again, it goes back to the point I raised is why do Kubrick's films attract this level of um, 
interpretation in a way that other, say, new horror from the 70s doesn't. You know, we don't have this with The Omen, The Exorcist, and the Rosemary's Baby. Right. But we do with The Shining. Um, so, so you know, that's worth, I think, further exploration. Um, and I, 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 you know, we did mention the paranoid style in American politics in the book, the mm-hmm. Richard Hostat. Mm-hmm. Say. I think that has a role to play in it as well. But, you know, it, it really would be worth a kind of, I know in Hunter talks about cult and cultish readings in his book. Uh, but it would be worth something thinking about in, in, in longer, deeper terms. I, I I think the point you made about um, the the those who are interested in ascribing conspiracy theories only tend to focus on one film instead of, you know, if that were their pattern logic, it should uh, follow suit that they would look at his entire body of work, and yet they don't. I think that's a really interesting point you made, Nathan. There is one person who is consistent in their analysis. In these, is that Julie Kearns online who, you know... The Adopolis Press, in, yeah. Yeah, she was featured in Room 237 with the Minotaur. Mm-hmm. And, you know, agree with her or not, to be fair, she's gone deep on all the movies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And worked at it. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that others who want to conspiratorialize need to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um to if you know if they want to have have any kind of validity well yeah you have that as the exception to the rule unfortunately i think what uh many of us feel is the unnecessary bits are the people on social media it it's a lot of it is just lazy i think it's and very self-centered self-absorbed approaches to uh, I you know use the word study loosely. They're studying a Kubrick film from their own uh, rather self-centered perspective, and you know I've 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 heard I won't mention them by name, but I've I, I've heard the podcast one of the big conspiracy theorists, and they are in the two three seven documentary, and the host of the podcast uh, lists the films that. Uh, Kubrick directed and, and says, oh, and he's just listing them off. And he says, I mean, we're talking about masterpieces like The Shining and Full Metal Jacket and Apocalypse Now. And this famous conspiracy theorist does not correct them. And I'm like, why are you out there doing this? But I mean, it, it does seem that, uh, you know, there's it, the genie's out of the bottle with that one. There's going to be no stopping it as long as there is social media and for better or worse, people are free to do that. I think in a strange sense, it, it means that uh, Kubrick means that much to so many people that everybody has their own take on it, whether I agree with it or not. Or I should yeah, say I whether we agree Kubrick, with it. Yeah, I wonder how much Kubrick means to Alex Jones, you know. <laughs> yeah, oh, please. Oh, that guy. I want to ask uh, a question about the final chapter in your book, which you titled Non-Submersible Units, an analysis of key scenes in Eyes Wide Shut. Now, we know, of course, the phrase non-submersible units was something that Kubrick used many times. Uh, And I'd like to ask you both, uh, Robert, first, what is a non-submersible unit? Um, They are the big elements, the big scenes, the big sequences uh, so the orgy, for example, is a non-submersible unit without which the film could not exist. Um, and then there are the connective tissue, um, the scenes, um, the inserts of uh, New York streets, um, the sequences of, uh, uh, of Bill walking uh, across the, uh, the streets. Uh, so the non-submersible unit is the um, the climactic sequence of the film, the um, exchange between Bill and uh, Ziegler. Um, so all of the films, well, some of the films, I, I would say, for example, that 2001 is all non-submersible unit because the spectacle never stops. Um, but other films have 
you know, I think what Kubrick was was on what Kubrick understood was that you can't go at a peak for the distance that you have to lower the temperature and then ride, make it rise again and create a kind of editorial rhythm. Hmm. Again, like music, which is akin yeah. to breathing in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dynamism. Um, Nathan, what, um, what's your take on non-submersible units and how, how were you able to come, were you able to come across any other examples of that in the archive, him referencing that? Um, I don't really have anything to add there. I'm not sure, again, that we saw that phrase written down anywhere, did we, Bob? No, we really had to search. It was, it's mentioned by someone, I forget who, that, who quotes Kubrick as telling him that. Is it Brian, Brian Aldis, maybe? It could be, yeah. I think you're right. His way of making a film was to concentrate on seven or eight as he called them, non-submersible units. And what this meant was you had a very good chunk, you had another good chunk, and when you had got six good chunks, you were almost home with a movie. It would be easy to connect them. And you can see this principle operating, in particular, in 2001. It's interesting, because um, we were having a discussion in the Netherlands about... Um, the phrase that Jack Nicholson says on the Life and Pictures DVD about um, about um, you, you don't f- try to photograph r- the reality, you photograph the photograph of the reality. But then it was suggested, right? That was that's the only source for that quote. So we we therefore do we even know that that was something Kubrick said? <laughs> uh, you know, not to dispute our own research on non-submersible units, but um, the interesting thing was, if you actually read the chapter, we, we, we do more than analysis of the key scenes, right? We do what, what Bob, I think Bob used the phrase connective tissue. And the fascinating thing about going through it was, yeah, we, at first we started to look at the big, you know, the opening and um, the party, Ziegler's first party and but as you as we went through it, it's like no, the little bits in between are just as important in a way. Yeah. And in a sense that we had to stop ourselves from doing it. I mean, there came a point where I think when you said earlier, every artist knows when to stop painting. I I was like, Bob, can we squeeze one more thing in? And he's like, No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had a word count. It's like I, it's with one more fact. <laughs> and and we. I suppose we had trouble with that final one because, you know, and, and I think the beauty of Eyes Wide Shut is even now I'm reading interpretations or having discussions with people on, on, on your site and elsewhere where you're like, yeah, huh, I hadn't thought of that. And if you want to go back and rewrite, add, you know, these new ideas and the, even the bits, this connective tissue is important, um, where some people felt that, that those bits could have been edited out because they were long or they made the film boring or whatnot. I was thinking, actually, no, key information's being conveyed here. It just isn't done in a loud, explosive way, as Bob said it. It's done in a more subtle, uh, subtle way. Um, that's great. I mean, the, um, the thing you mentioned with regards to Nicholson's quote, I experienced something like that uh, once with regards to uh, a quote that only Joe Turkel uh, claims, you know, to have been privy to, which was Stanley saying, "Music bends time," and our friend James Marinaccio, who's you know really involved with Stanley Kubrick Appreciation Society, and of course this podcast, he found uh, a lecture that Joe Turkel had given uh, at his public library many years ago. And thankfully he, I think it was back on VHS tape. He documented it. He transferred it to digital and he did post it to SCAS. And of course, as a musician that jumped out to me because like, I love, you know, that Stanley was a drummer. I love that he was a lifelong music file. And, um, I remember when I posted something about that, I think I made a little meme with, uh, uh, uh Dr. Bowman going through, 
uh, the Stargate at the end and just putting the words music bends time and Simone Odino said, oh, where did you, are you sure that's an actual quote? And I had to scramble and say, oh, wait, uh, yeah, I think, and I think it was Stephen who came to my assistance and said, yes, that was from Joe Turkel's lecture. But if it's one person who knew Stanley well enough and we don't have a second source, is it wrong to suggest that he did say that? I don't think so. Not the day he's talking about movie making. This killed me. He's well, you see your whole picture together and you see a soft spot where there's the pace is not right, the tempo is not right, you fix it with music because music bends time. I said, what? He says, music bends time. I said, what do you mean? He says, if you come to a part in the picture where it's very fast, you can slow it up with music. If it's very slow, you can pick it up with music. I says, give me an example, Stanley. I've never heard of this before. He says, every director knows this, Joe. Every director worth his salt knows this. There's a picture called the Ten Commandments. Everybody saw the Ten Commandments. He says, go to the scene where the Pharaoh says, take the Israelites and leave, and the Hebrews make the exodus. And the music is Wagnerian, dum da 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 and the sound is crashing, it's tremendous. Then play the scene over again. Rewind it, play it over again, cut the sound off. And all you'll see are poor old people barely moving, barely walking, barely oxen pulling carts, and they're not even moving. It's as slow as frozen glue. I said, I never thought of that, Stanley. Sure enough, I got home, put it on, did it, played it, and he was 100% correct. Music has the ability to bend time. So I've just got a couple more questions, guys. Um... Eyes Wide Shut, we know, is, you know, based on Schnitzler's, you know, dream story is the English language interpretation. Uh, Nicole Kidman's character experiences actual dreams during the narrative of the film. Um, so we have to ask, wh- what are your takes on the film? Is it a dream uh, or is it part of a dream? Do you think perhaps uh, Bill Harford is inhabiting a dream world throughout? I think all of Kubrick's films um, take place in that liminal space between dreams and waking, the hypnagogic state. And uh, Eyes Wide Shut is a perfect example of that. It's not a dream. It's not awake. It's just in that space where extraordinary things happen. Extraordinary images cross the mind or float past the eyes where little stories are made up, uh, where the imagination sort of runs wild before it deeps into sleep. (laughs) How can I top that? I mean, I think initially I I, I did wonder if the whole movie was a dream or if the dream starts at certain points. Um, And then I thought, well, if it is all a dream, then, you know, so what about the points that it's making? It would undermine this exploration of marriage, fidelity, jealousy, you know, so, but I, I entirely agree with Bob. I think, I think many of us, if we go back to his first film, 50, first feature film in 53, I like the argument that Kubrick wanted that film destroyed, not because he was embarrassed by it, but because it revealed too much of his hand. He, he gave away too much and he, he didn't, that was the key. Um, and that was, particularly in the opening narration that just said, this is, this is an alleg. He, mm-hmm. sorry, he, he explained somewhere. This is an allegory. Country. This doesn't take, yeah. It takes right, place right. in the country. Of mind. And I think, you know, and that's another way of putting what, what Bob's just said is that all his movies take place in the country of the mind. Um, you know, for me, when you watch the shining, that long opening traveling shot is there to show, in a way that all of Apocalypse Now was a year earlier, this is this is a psychic journey. You know, a road movie isn't about traveling down the road and uh, you know and getting from A to B. It's about a journey, a psychological journey, like Easy Rider or something. And and I think Kubrick's films in the same way, Full Metal Jacket. Why the emphasis on the helmet? You know, in the advertising, because I think there's an element of this. This, it, 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 as realistic as this might look, and it's we're not meant to necessarily take it as being literal. Um, and therefore, you know, one can say that 
elements of this movie are are a dream or, or between dream and waking. But if it's entirely a dream, then 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 what's the point? You know, another yeah. director would have done that. You know, Bobby uh, Jr. Bobby Ewing wakes up in the shower. We're not having <laughs> not Kubrick. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> yeah, and I believe in uh, Raphael's book, uh, Raphael at one point said. Uh, why don't we have the whole film as a dream? And Kubrick turned around and said, if it's all a dream, we haven't got a movie. We've got to have some element of it in reality. Uh, so that was a, a, a discussion at script stage, I believe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, why why make a dream movie about that then? You know, do you see what I mean? If you're going to make a film with, with something in it, you know, if it's like The Sixth Sense, right? That's it. Once you've watched it, that's it. Right. You know, you figured it out. You go back to see how it was done. Then what other reason is there to watch it? That's not Kubrick, right? Yeah. The um, Usual Suspects just... as well. That was the Brian Singer's film. That was the big, the big reveal of Kaiser Soze. And I, I, I've i debated with friends over the years. They said, it's uh, oh, it's one of their favorite movies to watch again and again. And I'm like, no, but once you know Kevin Spacey is behind the whole thing, it doesn't... So I agree, like, Kubrick would have never done it. And it also, it always, for me, seems to go back to that, you know, classic Wizard of Oz analogy. If you have a... If it's all just a dream, you know, at the end of Eyes Wide Shut, for it to just be a dream, you'd at least have to have, you know, the Scarecrow and the Tin Man and the Lion or some iteration of those archetypes show up at the end to explain well you know it's real but it wasn't or it wasn't but it is and leave mm-hmm. it to the audience's interpretation because it's it's easy to forget now that so much time has gone by and so many things have been done even the matrix to an extent and there are many other films um the, the joker for instance the new one with joaquin it, there's you know uh, a compliment to be paid that it requires your participation because you're not really sure what is really happening and what might be his imagination. Um, and I don't think that's spoiling anything, but the archetype always for me goes back to Wizard of Oz. If you're going, you, you can never do a dream movie after that one was done and just have it be a dream. So I, I want to just ask one last question because there is no right answer to this one. And we love asking people. Uh, Robert, I'm going to ask you first. Stanley Kubrick was one of the great artists of the 20th century. Nathan. Stanley Kubrick is, is and was a New York Jewish intellectual. <laughs> Stephen, can you top that? I think those are both among the best answers we've ever got. No, I'd just, I'd just use both of them together. Okay, well, there you have it, everybody. Big thanks to Robert and Nathan, as well as their faithful, furry, and four-legged friends, Luna, Moose, and Pepper, because we never need an excuse to have good dogs on this show. Okay, their book, Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick and the Making of His Final Film, is currently available from Oxford University Press, and of course, the gaping maw behemoth of the planet's shopping cart that is now Amazon. Okay. This is Jason Furlong signing off on behalf of Stephen Rigg, Mark Lentz, James Marinaccio, and every single Kubrick fan out there who makes this podcast so much fun to do. I'm going to now turn it over to my good buddy in the booth, the legendary lounge singer and late night FM DJ, Stick Blightengale. Take it away, Stick. Hey, thanks, guy. We're going to leave you now with a song called Fidelio. It's the newest hit single from the band Festin, and it's sweeping the ocean. Be sure to pick up their latest album, Inside Stanley Kubrick, on SK Tell Records and Tapes. And be sure to use this revolutionary new invention, the Interwebs, to check out the band's website for upcoming <laughs> gigs. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll be seeing you beyond the infinite. Hey, 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 hey. Right, enough of that. 
donut shop's not even open. It's not going to be open for four hours. All right. I digress. I donut grass. One, two, one, two, three, four. That's it for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. On the bass, Mr. Larry McVeigh. On the drums, Kip Fleming. And on the guitar, the one, the only, Mr. Bobby Berman. We hope you enjoyed the music tonight. We're going to be here for the next two weeks, so please do stop by. I'm Nick Nightingale. Good night. It's Kubrick's universe. We just live in it. We have taken very thorough precautions in this podcast against broadcasting anything which might only be attributed to human error. Thank you for listening to the Stanley Kubrick Podcast. Come back soon.